Hello friends, I'm Santanam and in this video we are going to look at the editorials which came on the second week of January. The first article is titled Standing Up for Human Rights which came on the 8th of January. And uh, what is this article about? This article actually tells us why India should adopt a domestic anti-torture law. Let's try to understand the background first. See, in 1987, there was a UN convention against torture. And uh, this convention, what it does is, any country which uh, signs this treaty uh, will have to uh, prevent torture within its territory. And also, it forbids states which have signed and ratified this torture uh, treaty to transport people to any country where there is a potential, they, where they could be tortured. So this is that uh, anti-torture uh, convention, UN convention, uh, which, was, uh, which was created in 1987. So what about India's stance on humanitarianism? So you see, in Article 21 of our constitution, there is light, right to life with dignity. And uh, we also claim that the end objective of the Indian state, the idea of India, is actually human dignity. And uh, also, uh, the UN Convention Against Torture, India is a signatory of that. It's signed in 1997. So from these attributes, we can tell that India is a champion for human rights. Specifically, let's look at what the Supreme Court has said. You see, the Supreme Court has told this about human dignity, that it is inalienable and inseparable from human existence in the Potasami judgment of 2017. Also, what it tells about torture is synonymous with the darker side of human civilization and a naked violation of human dignity. From these two judgments, we can say that the Supreme Court has actually linked torture along with human dignity. There is one more jurisprudence. The Supreme Court has said that domestic laws should be aligned with the international legal regime. This direction has been uh, set uh, in the Puttasami case and Nalsa case. So what we can understand is that India's domestic laws should be on par with the international laws. Which means India should ratify the UNCAT. But just let's look at the current uh, state of affairs with respect to torture in India. You see, even though we have signed it, we have not yet ratified the UNCAT. And also, we don't have any standalone domestic law against custodial torture. And the Supreme Court is unwilling to nudge the legislature to frame such a law. This is the current state of affairs with respect to torture, custodial torture in India. Now, a domestic law can be framed either by the parliament or the Supreme Court can ask the parliament to frame a law. In the case of custodial torture, the Supreme Court has not asked the parliament to frame a law, which is a departure from its previous precedence because previously the Supreme Court has actually asked the parliament to frame laws in various circumstances. Let's look at them. You see, in the Vishaka case of 1997, the Supreme Court framed procedural guidelines to be followed in term in cases of sexual harassment. And in the DK Basu case of 1997, the Supreme Court created guidelines which uh, has to be followed while making an arrest. Making an arrest. In the Vineet Narain case, the Supreme Court and, uh, created guidelines to ensure that the CBI functions autonomous and remains independent. In the ADR reforms of 2002, the Supreme Court ensured that all candidates who are contesting in elections have to reveal about any uh, uh, proceedings, accusations or allegations against them which could lead uh, to, a, to an imprisonment of two years, which is an uh, electoral reform. In the Swami Achyudananda Tirth case, the Supreme Court asked the centre to amend the laws making adulteration of milk a very serious offence. In the Triple Tala case of 2017, the Supreme Court directed the central government to create a divorce law to create the guidelines for divorce in an Islamic marriage. So in all these cases, these guidelines or procedures 
uh, have actually led to creation of laws, amendment of laws or a promulgation of guidelines which has to be followed by the government. The Supreme Court was able to do that for these cases. Why isn't the Supreme Court not doing anything with respect to torture which it itself has said that is against human dignity. Now that we have looked at what the Supreme Court has done so far, let's try to look at what the government says. See, the government stance is that it supports a law against torture. The chairman of Rajya Sabha, who is the vice president, has said that human rights are guaranteed because it is, being, it is a part of our DNA. In 2010, the Rajya Sabha Select Committee proposed an anti-torture law. And in 2017, Law Commission proposed a standalone anti-torture law, a domestic anti-torture law. And India has been repeatedly giving assurance at the UN saying that it is going to enact a domestic torture law. So the government is also is in favor of an anti-torture law only. But still, this law has not been framed and the initiation for making of such a law has not been done by the government and the Supreme Court is refraining from asking the government to frame that law. So what are the repercussions for us for not framing a domestic law or not ratifying the UNCAT? You see, extradition proceedings are halted for those who are facing criminal trials in India but are actually staying in countries which are actually a signatory of the UNCAT and who have ratified it. So those people are escaping from Indian criminal justice system. And what is the long term and the bigger aspect of uh, not ratifying uh, the UNCAT or uh, not having a domestic torture law is that we will be a defaulter of our international commitments which means that our voice is diminished at the global arena. So it is essential that we soon ratify the UN uh, Convention Against Torture and enact domestic anti-torture law against custodial torture. Moving on, the next article is titled Sum of Contributions and uh, this article came on the 8th of January. Uh, so what is this article about? This article talks about what the states within India can do for achieving India's INDCs for the Paris Climate Agreement. Let's look at the background first. What is the Paris Agreement? See, the Paris Agreement is a framework within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So what does it deal with? It deals with mitigation against greenhouse gases and adaptation for climate change and finance for such adaptations. And uh, what is the specific aim of this agreement? This agreement aims to ensure that the global temperature rise is below 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. So why this 2 degrees Celsius is because there is a theory that if the global average temperature rises beyond this 2 degrees centigrade, it might lead to consequences from which we cannot recover. So that's why they have fixed this 2 degrees Celsius as the standard within which we have to keep the global average temperature. So what about India's uh, INDCs to UNFCC. First of all, what is INDC? It is intended, intended nationally determined contributions. So what it means is that India is going to give an estimate of how much it's going to reduce its greenhouse gas emission levels. So to be specific, India has said that it will reduce the emissions intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35 percent by, uh, by 2030 from 2005 level. So, so what is this emissions intensity? It is the ratio of the amount of greenhouse gases released to that of GDP. Another objective of India's INDC is that it says that 40% of the cumulative electric power that is installed in India will be from non-fossil fuel based energy which could be solar, wind, nuclear or anything. And finally, India has said that it will create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of 
CO2 equivalent by 2030 and this it will do by creating uh, additional forest covers and tree covers. So now we have a background about what the Paris Agreement is about and what India is planning to do for that agreement. Let's look at uh, the article itself. You see, there is something called as Emissions Gap Report, which is released by the United Nations Environment Program. And what this Emissions Gap Report is saying, the INDCs given by the countries is not sufficient enough to keep the global warming below that 2 degree centigrade mentioned in the agreement. So it is asking the countries to do more for it. It is in this context that the Talanova Dialogue is going to take place in 2018. What is Talanova? You see, Talanova is a process of uh, storytelling where they share ideas, skills, experience and knowledge to ensure that they take wise decisions for the collective good. So the reason why we are going for this is because the parties of the Paris Agreement are actually blaming each other for not doing enough and uh, asking each other to do more. Uh, and uh, this misunderstanding and uh, lack of communication has to be brought down. And also there should be sharing of knowledge uh, with which a country can actually try to contribute more for this agreement. So it is for this reason that uh, this theme is being organized for this year's climate conference. And also you should note that this Salanova is actually a word used in the country of Fiji uh, and also in the Pacific Islands. It's a traditional word. Another key word mentioned in the article is the bottom-up approach. So bottom-up approach is when changes takes place in the grassroots level, activities take place in the grassroots level and uh, that information and, and the information and knowledge created at the grassroots level is absorbed by the people above and adopted as ideals and is used for problem solving. So, in this bottom-up approach, it is essential that within India, the participation of states is taking place. There is something called as under two coalition, which is a memorandum of understanding of sub-national governments, which means that states within India will have an understanding with states within the other countries, provinces of China, states of the United States, and uh, states of Canada, like that. So this is to make sure that the involvement doesn't happen only within the federal governments of all the countries, but also state governments of all the countries. So this under two coalition aims to reduce the greenhouse gas level to net zero by 2050. In India, Telangana and Chhattisgarh are signatories of this under two coalition. So there are two states in India which are signatories of this uh, coalition, which is actually, which is very less compared to China or US, which has 26 and 24 uh, representations respectively. So the article says that the states has to participate more, use uh, these kinds of mechanisms uh, to ensure that our uh, climate goals are attained. So what is the conclusion of this article? The article says that the national and state level action plan has to be reviewed and reassessed as per the changing needs and the principle of CBDR must be applied. So what is CBDR? CBDR is common but differentiated responsibilities. So CBDR principle is applied uh, in, pro in uh, international protocols and uh, what it means is that the, the countries which has polluted the most has to take more action and uh, vacate some carbon space for the countries which are developing and which have not polluted as much as other countries. For example, the United States has polluted way more than India or China. So the United States has to do more in terms of climate mitigation. And uh, this article says that this CBDR principle must be applied for states within India as well which means that the states within India, which has polluted more, has to do more for mitigation of climate change. And finally, the article says that uh, knowledge action network should be set up for knowledge sharing and efficient adaptation of uh, climate uh, mitigation activities. And uh, in this aspect, Kerala is actually a leader because they have already taken a step to create such a network. Moving on to the next article. The next article is titled Prescription for the Future. 
and uh, this article is actually about the National Medical Com Commission uh, bill which has been under a lot of debate lately and uh, what the author says uh, is about fine tuning this bill in order to serve the rural health care. It is at this point that I want uh, to note that an editorial discussion of this National Medical Commission bill and the Medical uh, Council of India has been done in last week's video. So please refer to that video because it has been uh, uh, dealt in detail and in depth of the features of the act and uh, the problems with Medical Council of India. So that will be a very good reference for it. And I will deal with points which are actually new and unique to this article. So this article actually talks about two steps taken in the new bill which, is, which are in the right direction. So the first is distribution of powers. Previously, Medical Council of India did everything uh, with respect to medical education as well as uh, monitoring of the medical field in India. It wielded ultimate power and that has been broken down into four autonomous boards in the new Medical Commission Bill. So what are, uh, what are those four boards? One will deal with undergraduate education, another will deal with postgraduate, the third will deal with assessment and rating of medical colleges, the fourth will deal with ethics and registration. This is a good sign because a decentralized administration means there is more innovation, there is less corruption and there is more efficiency. The second step taken in this bill which the article says that is in the right direction is inclusion of non-doctors in the commission. Earlier only doctors were present in the council, Medical Council of India and uh, this bill ensures that non-doctors like patient rights advocates and ethicists are also a part of the council. So this means that uh, there is more diversity and uh, this also ensures that there is more transparency and accountability for the new commission. And uh, this practice is in line with the practice which is followed by medical regulators of UK, Australia and Canada. But there is one concern with respect to this bill which is the selection of members. It is to be noted that the central government will be selecting most of the commission's members. And uh, this means that there will be a lot of political hold on the commission and that's not desirable. So, and the author suggests two redressal mechanisms for it. The first redressal mechanism the author says is that there should be more number of elected members with a limited term of office. This is to ensure that there is no corruption. There is a reduction in corruption. And uh, another alternative which the author says is to set up a body like the UPSC to select the members of this commission. So apart from giving these suggestions, this article also deals with how to handle the problem of in inadequate, inefficient rural healthcare system in India. So what is the scenario right now? The scenario is that the doctor to people ratio is 1 is to 1700 instead of the ideal 1 is to 1000. And most of these doctors are actually present in the urban centers, which means that when there is already a deficiency in the number of doctors, and most of those doctors are present in the urbanized area leads to severe healthcare inefficiency and inadequacy in the rural areas. So this bill actually envisions adding so many number of doctors uh, into the system. But even if we keep adding so many, uh, even if we keep adding lots of doctors, uh, it is still going to take 10 more years to achieve uh, this ratio. And uh, we cannot ask the people of this country to wait for uh, those 10 years or, or uh, ask them to wait until all the rural areas become urbanized. So for this the, uh, the author gives a solution. The author says that you should train non-doctors. There is a concept called licentiate doctors. This was uh, practiced in British India, in colonial India. And uh, these are actually people who are not MBBS doctors but people who are trained in basic functions of healthcare. And uh, international organizations like Medicine Sans Frontiers and Red Cross actually advocate uh, the establishment of uh, such a cadet of uh, non-doctors into the field of healthcare. Because it has been proven in uh, countries like Thailand that such uh, inclusion of licentiate doctors or non-doctors or informal doctors into the healthcare system uh, is actually helpful in bringing healthcare services to the remotest and the poorest sections of the society. And uh, in India, it was shown that 
9 months of training led to improvement in the ability of such informal doctors uh, in providing uh, healthcare services in West Bengal. And uh, it is based on these kinds of uh, ideas that Chhattisgarh tried to uh, create such a cadre of uh, licentiate uh, doctors, uh, but it was actually withdrawn because the MBBS doctors protested against it. So what is the conclusion of this article? The author says that we should not uh, think of delivering healthcare services only through MBBS doctors because there are proven studies which states that the, apart from MBBS doctors there are other ways to uh, deliver healthcare services in rural areas and uh, this bill should have an open mind in ensuring that this option is not entirely ruled out. Let's look at the next article which is titled Not by Dikta Talon which came on the 11th of January. So what is this article about? This article is appreciative for the Supreme Court move to make playing of national anthem optional in cinema halls. So let's look at the background. You see in November 30, 2016, Justice Deepak Mishra, the current Chief Justice of India, said that all cinema halls in India shall play the national anthem before the feature film starts and all the moviegoers are obliged to stand up and pay respects for it. This directive led to a lot of social debates and discussions. There are many supporters and opposers for this directive. But uh, recently, as this article says, the Supreme Court has actually withdrawn that directive and made it optional instead of mandating it. There are certain key words and phrases in this article which we will look at. The first is Prevention of Insults to National Honours Act 1971. So this act prohibits the insult and desecration of national symbols. So that's all this act is about. Constitutional patriotism. This is a phrase which is used in the article and uh, this phrase is actually derived from Germany. So after World War II, the Germans wanted to have a sense of solidarity, a sense of a community as a single community. But while doing that, they wanted to avoid being ultra-nationalistic, which was the reason for World War II. So it was then that constitutional patriotism was framed. So the philosophy of constitutional patriotism is that people should form attachment to the norms and values of liberalism rather than blood or faith. That's the gist of the philosophy. Another key phrase used in the article is moral policing. In a democratic country like India, the court is mandating the people to stand up and show respect to the national anthem. And the author says that this amounts to moral policing. And uh, another uh, key word mentioned is vigilantism. This is an unforeseen circumstance of this directive. What happened was, in the cinema halls, people started looking for signs of disrespect uh, amongst other moviegoers and some people were beaten up and thrashed for allegedly showing disrespect to the national anthem. And the final phrase mentioned uh, in the article is, unwilling participants in a coercive project. So the cinema halls were singled out in this directive where the national anthem has to be played mandatorily. When this directive was passed, playing of national anthem was not mandatory in the parliament or state legislative assemblies. So ultimately what this means is that people were made to participate in this experiment. Justice D.Y. Chandrachud has said that there was no need for an Indian to wear his patriotism on his sleeve, rightfully so. And the conclusion of this article is that the government and the judiciary has to by default presume that there is a natural respect for symbols of national honor in India and there should not be any forceful means used by the government or the judiciary to make people show respect to the national symbols. The next article is titled Thinking Beyond Quotas which came on the 11th of January. So what is this article about? This article actually emphasizes on skilling the youth rather than giving them reservations. So let's look at the background first. There has been protests by Gujars in Rajasthan, Jats in Haryana and Patels in Gujarat. And all of these protests were against the reservation. If you look at uh, this image, it shows that people are against reservation. And uh, what they are saying is that reservation has sidelined them has marginalized them and uh, given them lesser and lesser opportunities as decades goes by. Note that 
these communities are actually very politically powerful but while they are protesting like this there is a propagation of a sense of victimhood amongst these communities and this is a serious challenge for the maintenance of law and order and the ethos of our country the author argues that the concept of reservation was once limited focused and it was absolutely necessary but as decades went by the reservation process itself is spiraling out of control hardik patel a patiadar activist in gujarat asks the government to either free the country from reservations or make everybody the slave of reservations so what uh, he is saying is that either abolish reservations or include us in the reservations as well now here is where the author of this article gives a suggestion the author says that skill development can do more than the reservation because empowering the youth with skills will build the country's human capital way more quickly and effectively than what reservations can achieve so what are the avenues for skill development vocational training can be improved through schemes and uh, technical training can be encouraged and this can actually develop a robust workforce and finally the author says that skilling of the indian youth can be done using mgnregs so what is the conclusion of this article the article concludes saying that we should take better decisions from which we will have fewer regrets which means the author observes that there is a clamor for reservations more and more we have to think smartly in terms of empowering our youth not just by reservations but could also be through skill development moving on to the next article which is titled a needless pursuit came on the 12th of january so what is this article about this article deals with india's move to gain official language status for hindi at the un and uh, this article is very critical of that move so let's try to understand what the official and working languages concept at the un is you see english and french are working languages chinese russian spanish arabic apart from english and french are official languages so you see the united nations itself is a body concerning of countries across the world and like there are so many different languages uh, since there has to be a common medium of instruction or common medium of communication between them they have adopted they had adopted english and french as the working language initially but in order to encourage pluralism and multilingualism they started adopting chinese russian spanish arabic as well see this was actually practiced by the un to make sure that its goals and actions are understood by, by the widest possible public so now india is promoting hindi at the un why is india promoting hindi the first reason could be because it wants to enhance its stature amongst languages and the other reason for promoting hindi is to propagating the greater use of the hindi language itself the author identifies certain flaws in this move so what are those flaws you see as it is the un is some distance away from achieving its multilingual goals the un wanted to be pluralistic it wanted to have so many other languages used in its communications but you see the availability of official documents in all official languages all those six official languages is limited to only some areas in the secretary activity so already there is not much achievement in the un's multilingual goals so if we are going to add one more language to that it is going it is probably going to make the situation worse and the second flaw is that india cannot get two third of the countries to share the expenditure for the translations and interpretations this is a requirement for india to get the official language status for hindi and moreover bangladesh is asking for bengali as an official language in the un so now there is clamor to include other languages into the pool of un official languages and the final logical flaw here is that this move assumes that there will be only hindi speaking ministers from india who will be representing india at the un so what is the conclusion of this article the article says that india is a linguistically plural country it's not given an impression at the un which is a global platform which is a truly global platform that it has one preeminent language amongst all its languages moving on to the final article titled rights in the age of big data which came on the 
13th of January. So what is this article about? This article talks about the data protection legislation in India and uh, the author emphasizes that focus should be more on the rights of the individual rather than the demand for innovation. So there are two committees which has been constituted by the government earlier. One in 2012 called AP Shah Committee. Another in 2017 is called Sri Krishna Committee. We will be looking at them both in subsequent slides. In the 2017 Sri Krishna Committee report, they have released a framework for data protection law in India and they are seeking, uh, they are seeking uh, views from all stakeholders which could be the civil societies, uh, the government bodies and especially the public. The author of this article has gone through this report and has raised certain concerns and let's look at them. You see the main concern is that the report presumes to hold the fundamental rights and innovation as somewhat equal or uh, at the very least as competing values. So which means that both of them are in equal footing which ideally shouldn't be the case because the fundamental right is guaranteed by the constitution and the very demands and nature of technological innovations are dynamic and it is always changing. So you cannot have them both on equal footing. So. This entire uh, concept of having a data protection law and the necessity for data protection came after the judgment on privacy, which came on the August of 2017. So what did that judgment say? That judgment said that a carefully structured regime, a law for protection of data may be created. It also emphasized that due regard should be given for this particular judgment while creating or framing such a law. Because the main observation of that judgment is that right to privacy exists as a natural right inherent in all fundamental rights of the constitution. And it is the obligation of the state to protect the privacy of the individual. So the Supreme Court has pushed the burden of privacy protection on the state. So the state cannot frame a law which goes against that order. So what does this imply? A joint reading of this judgment implies that data protection laws should shield the individuals rather than commercial interests or technological innovation, which means a demand for technological innovation or a demand for a commercial or corporate interest should not outweigh the fundamental principle of data protection and privacy of an individual. So we are protecting the privacy of an individual. What about the technology? Should we just uh, flush it down the drain? No, but one must acknowledge that technology is a means and not the end in itself. It must exist and work within the frame of the rule of law. Technological innovations can help in enhancing the rule of law, but it should not alter or change the rule of law as per its own needs. Joseph Weizenbaum, a German American computer scientist says that science promised manpower, but so often people are seduced by promises of power and the price extracted is servitude and impotence. In this aspect, the AP Shah committee of 2012 said that privacy act should not make any reference to specific technologies and must be generic so that the enforcement mechanisms are adaptable to the dynamic nature of the marketplace, the governance systems and the technology in place. So this article concludes by saying that constitutionalism should be the guide, which means whatever that's written in the constitution should be given priority, should be given privilege. That is individual rights should have more privileges, should be given more support rather than innovation. Thanks for watching these videos. For more such videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more free content on civil service examination preparation, please subscribe to our Telegram channel as well.